Okay, so um, so any questions based on you know what we looked at so far, um, chapter ten, one Corinthians chapter ten. Any any doubts or any questions? Uh, let's take some time to talk about that. Um, because it's important for us to again understand um, you know, why Paul is addressing you know these things. So we'll have the right perspective ourselves, and also for those of us who are you know in places of spiritual leadership, that we'll also address it in the right manner, you not know, teach the right way. Um, yeah. Any any questions? Any. Um, okay, so okay, no questions from Kiran. Anyone else? Okay, so the thing is, um, I hope it's clear that um, the the kind of connections that, uh, that Paul is, uh, um, you know, Paul is bringing in. He's talking about communion. He's talking about the table of the Lord, and uh, he's talking about the table of demons. So when he's saying when he's saying that, you know, we know that. Uh, Communion is uh, is an act of worship, is an act of acknowledgement, is a is a time of uh, you know uh, submitting, acknowledging what the Lord has done, and therefore uh, it is uh, it is uh, when we take part, you know, it is um, in faith that it is uh, it is bringing us to a place of oneness. So, uh, and Paul's uh, intention is that that oneness is with the Lord alone. You cannot have that oneness with demons, or you, nor should you, you know, even knowingly or knowingly, open yourself to that kind of oneness, right? Which is again the whole aspect of worship. Right? It is not just eating something, but he's talking about the table of demons, right? Which, which was an invitation, which, which, uh, which uh, the Corinthian maybe you know they they were in the habit of doing. They they continue to do that. Uh, and maybe they felt they felt that okay, hey, this is nothing. You know, the, I know the idol is nothing. I know the food offered to idol is nothing. So you know, there's nothing wrong in uh, being there and doing that. Okay, being part of that table of demons, right? So he's talking about the entire worship of demons. Right? He's talk, talking about the entire uh, steps taken, maybe uh, the ritual, maybe right. So he's talking about that. So uh, we need to make that, uh, you know, be clear about that. Uh, like just like how we saw in chapter eight, where Paul very clearly says that uh, you know it's it's not about the idol, it's not about the food, but it's about the uh, one who is watching, who is not mature, who is probably weak in faith, and for that sake, for that person's sake, I will not eat a food that is offered to idol. Okay, very clear. So here. He ends this uh, by saying that you know all things are helpful, but I'm going to ask two questions. You know, all things are law lawful. It's allowed. Is it going to be? Is it helpful for me? Is it? Does it edify me? Right? Does it build me up spiritually? Does it? Uh, uh, is it helpful for me? Um, so uh, the other thing is that I'm not going to seek my own benefit but i'm going to watch out for others you know does it benefit the other person also like let each one seek not his own but also the others well being right okay let's look at verses 25 to 33 and uh, and this kind of brings an end to this whole discussion of um, things offered to idols okay and idol worship so he's saying eat whatever is sold in the meat market asking no questions for conscience sake for the Lord, for the earth is the Lord's, he's quoting Psalm 24, 1. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those, uh, so that's one thing. Okay, so whatever is sold in the meat market, if whatever is available in the market, just go, uh, you know, just I mean, you buy it, you purchase, you buy it, you cook it, you eat it, whatever. You know, it's fine. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you decide to go, eat whatever is set before you. 
asking more questions for conscience sake so he, he is uh, for the sake of the conscience um, and he's he will he's going to explain like whose conscience and 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 you know uh, so on so conscience we know you know is a, a sense of right and wrong and uh, the prompting in our in our in our uh, in our soul uh, based on what is you know what is right and wrong so so he's saying uh, you know ask no questions for conscience sake but if anyone says to you this was offered to idols okay so he's what is the scenario you're going to someone's uh, okay prince i'm sorry i'm just seeing this now verse 21 okay i will uh, yeah we will ex i'll explain that okay so um so here he's saying you know uh, what is the scenario here so the scenario is that Somebody's invited for dinner, somebody's invited for a meal, you're in that person's house. And then that person says, you know, this was offered to idols. You know, this was offered as an act of worship to idols. Then he says, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. Okay. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. So what is he talking about? Whose conscience? He's saying, conscience, I say, verse 29, not your own, but that of the other. For when he asks the question, you know, why should my freedom be judged? Why is my liberty judged by another person's conscience? Right? So if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food for which I give thanks? Right? You know, uh, in... Um, I think it's in Timothy, right? Timothy, First Timothy, chapter four. Uh, let's read that. So he's saying uh, nothing is to be refused. Okay, First Timothy, chapter four. He says, uh, you know, he's talking about certain uh, wrong teachings. He's saying, you know, uh, he's, he's calling that doctrine of demons. What is it? He's saying, you know, the, uh, First Timothy four, verse one. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And he goes on to explain what is this, what are these lies and doctrines of demons, teachings of demons, saying, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, um, you know, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Okay, so, um, so that is something you know that he writes there. So we look at that scripture as well, and uh, and we see here, you know, he says verse thirty: For if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of of the food over which I give thanks? So he's you know, prayed, gave thanks to God, and it's sanctified, and he's eating it. Therefore, whatever you do, so he's so the thing is for the sake of the other person's conscience, he's saying, do not eat. You know, you can actually pray and eat it, nothing will happen, no problem. But for the sake of the other person's conscience, why he thinks that it's uh, I mean, he says that it is something that is offered to an idol, and for him it's an act of worship. He's acknowledging that idol is God. So therefore, when he's looking at you and you also eat. Um, like something like what Thomas shared, you know, last session, uh, the previous time when we met, he was talking about how we stopped eating because of what others would say. You know, others were, they were also thinking that he's fine. You know, he, he also acknowledges this as God. So for the sake of others' conscience, right, do not eat is what he's saying, right? Um, so verse 31 Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Okay, so in your eating and drinking, let God be glorified. So that's another question, you know, to we ask ourselves: Is God being glorified in this? Right. Uh, so, you know, is it helpful? Does it edify? Is God being glor glorified in this? These are, you know, very useful questions for the for the practical living of a believer. Is it helpful? Does it edify? Is God being glorified in this? Okay, so um, therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense. Now, here's another thing. You know, if you're going to refuse the food, 
that is being offered to you because you know someone says hey, this was offered to idols now you don't give any offense even in that refusal right give no offense um, either to the jew or to the greeks or to the church of god just as i also please all men in all things not seeking my own profit but the profit of benefit or the profit of many that they may be saved okay so uh, saying give no offense you know uh, don't do not offend uh, anyone jews greeks you know the church of god don't uh, offend people um, and uh, you know just as i also please all men in all things okay so that i might save some okay now we need to understand you know when we look at these words versus out of context then you know it results in compromise compromise of what compromise of the standards of the word compromise of the message right diluting the message it results in that okay if you just look at those two verses okay i give no offense okay i'm not going to offend you in what i say to you i'm not going to offend you therefore you know this if i think that gospel might offend you i'm not going to say it refer, results in compromise that's not what he's saying right because he preached the uncompromised gospel the message he preached the message of christ he preached about the 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 message of the cross he preached about the power of god right so that people's faith should be in the power of god not in the wisdom of men so he did all that right so when he's talking about giving no offense he's talking about you know primarily about refusing and in that refusing not offending right so which means you do it lovingly you do it lovingly do it firmly and also we with the understanding that the gospel is offensive the gospel message uh, will offend people right in the sense when you say that jesus christ is the only way that message is offensive right the message itself is offensive but you don't intentionally offend anyone okay there's a difference like you share the message of christ with love and uh, they will you know at times they will be offended because of the content of the message the truth of the message right but in your manner in which you deliver in the manner in which you share in the manner in which you behave with people don't offend them because paul says you know i i do not offend them i i become all things to all people to the jews as to jews to the gentiles as to gentiles to those without the law you know which he says um here you know in chapter 9 and uh, verses um you know verses 19 onwards right 19 to 23 he's repeating that here i i may also please all men in all things not seeking my own profit but the profit of many not seeking my own benefit but others benefits from the benefit of many that they may be saved okay so uh, to to put in a nutshell right there are there could be two scenarios he's talking about there could be two situations that you know the the corinthian believer and also us we might place ourselves in we might find ourselves in one is with regard to you know uh, what is sold in the meat market he's saying you know, if it is sold uh, it, you know yes we know that it might might be dedicated it might be you know offered first you know there are you know that's the culture that we live in okay in india also that's the thing you know everything could be dedicated to some deity and then sold okay so he's saying hey if it's sold in the market don't worry you know you can't avoid this situation right uh, don't worry just pray give thanks eat nothing no problem but if you're in somebody's house and then they're saying okay this was offered don't refuse it for the sake of the conscience not your conscience but others the other person's conscience why because he's saying you know that person considers this as an act of worship and he's bringing it to you and he's saying you know you also take it and you know your when you take it and when you receive it and when you eat it in his eyes it is an act of worship right you know it is an act of Uh, acknowledging the whatever he is worshiping as god so you are acknowledge so for that person's conscience do not okay do not eat okay we need to understand that very clear so so that is um, the whole thing of uh, food offered to idols that he is talking about okay so i hope that you know maybe changes our perspective right our the reason for which Uh, we we are we are we can eat or not eat 
this is the reason okay so um so we need to we need to really understand that so practically you know what do we do okay here are these uh, you know the, here here is the situation and here are the scenarios that is placed before us you might find yourself in one of these one or of one of these two uh, situations so don't do that okay so the the verse 21 what the prince is asking uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 21 is being part of the worship itself so prince so here uh, he's saying you cannot drink the cup of the lord and the cup of demons you not you cannot partake of the lord's table and the table of demons so this what what, what is he saying here he's saying you know so he's, he, the verses before that explain what communion is what communion does like when you take part of the Lord's table, uh, eat the bread and drink from the cup, this is what is happening. You are actually coming into a fellowship. You're the, and that word used there is koinonia, which means fellowship, partnership, sharing, um, coming to a place of union. Right. So, uh, so that is what is happening. So, in the same manner, he's saying that you know when it comes to the the whole thing of worship of idols and food offered to idols is part of it so he's saying you cannot be part uh, partaking of the table of demons okay you cannot be taking part in that okay and like uh, like what we saw the the in Corinth they had this um they had this ritual or they had this practice that um, people would be invited for worship of different deities and it will be called the table of so and so okay it will be table of whatever you know the name of that idol or name of that uh, uh, deity so um i mean when i say deity you know maybe it's part of you know whatever temple or you know it's the name of that so you are invited to this so here he's saying you know you're partaking as a believer you're partaking in the Lord's table. Now, I don't want you. You know what happens when you partake of the Lord's table. I don't want you to do that over there, and partake of the table of demons because you are actually placing yourself coming to a place of uh, fellowship, a koinonia, uh, you know, uh, that, that oneness, uh, spiritual union. So I don't want you to do that. Right. So that is what verse um, twenty-one is about. Uh, any other question, Prince, based on that? Is it clear? Um, if it's, uh, yeah, okay. You know, if it's, uh, if it's still, you have any doubt, you can still ask, okay? Um, anything in particular about verse 21, if you feel that um, something's not clear, you can, you can ask, okay. Okay, so so this is the thing. So um, so this is the reason, and this is, these are the reasons for which you know, Paul is saying that uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to look out for the benefit of the people. I'm going to uh, you know this is going to be our outlook. Whether we eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Do it for the glory of God, and you know, let that guide you. Okay, in all that you do, right? Okay. So chapter 10, we looked at uh, how he gives the example of the Old Testament example of people uh, in the wilderness and what happened to them and the things that happened to them were examples and uh, you know examples to admonish, correct us. So therefore, you know, consider that he lists down five things, right? Uh, uh, lusting after evil things, uh, idolatry, and these uh, what are the uh, three other things uh, that he talks about um, about uh, sexual impor impurity, immorality, uh, also uh, to avoid tempting Christ, uh, and also uh, the lastly about complaining and murmuring. Right. Um, so he says, you know, these these block our destiny. This uh, so you avoid doing it. And one of that is idolatry, uh, and uh, you know, replacing God with something else. Um, so avoid that. Don't do that. Flee from that. And then he goes on to explain about idol worship, 
and also this aspect of idol worship, this insight about communion and uh, you know being part of the idol worship itself and being part of the food that is you know or partaking of the food that is offered to idols and though in the natural things it seems a simple thing but significant spiritually this is what you are uh, doing so uh, you know don't do that um then some practical thing of you know what what is sold in the meat market what is sold in the market food that is sold in the market and also food that is offered when you go to somebody's house and uh, uh, you know eat it there's no problem but in someone's house when they say that this was offered so don't Right? So he explains why, and uh, so those are the reasons. Okay, so let's look at um, chapter eleven. Okay, so chapter eleven. Um, so he's talking about uh, uh, other a couple of other things that were there in the Corinthian church, and so uh, so he's he's going to address that uh, issue, right? Um, and and also we see that he's also going to talk about. The, the communion okay the, law, uh, the lord's table is going to be t talking about that as well okay so let's uh, let's read through okay. so um, starts by saying you know it's just a continuation continuation so you know I, just as i also please all men in all things not seeking my own profit but the profit of many that they may be saved so that's how uh, and then it continues by saying Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Okay, and then he's going to talk about uh, other, an, another aspect um, that he wants to address. Okay, so but, but he starts by saying, you know, imitate me as I also imitate Christ, right? So, um, uh, so he's saying, you know, what does imitate mean? Imitate means closely follow or mimic. Right, uh, mimic someone, see someone what they're doing, and do the same thing. Right, so so he's saying people. Uh, in, in other words, he's saying you know uh, imitate me, follow me closely, as I also follow the Lord closely. Okay, whatever I'm doing is what uh, you know. Whatever I'm following in my life, I'm following the Lord closely. Okay, so so you can actually imitate me, and it's a it's a very uh, you know when you look at that statement itself, it's a very challenging statement, like for every believer or you know if for every leader, and right, he's saying is is you know to tell someone you imitate me, you follow me as I follow the Lord. Okay, um, so that's a you know that's a powerful statement, right? But also it talks about Another aspect of leadership, which is, you know, I'm I myself personally, I'm going to follow the Lord, or I am following the Lord. Okay, so you know, uh, in in my teaching, in my mentoring, in all that, right? I'm doing that as I follow the Lord. Okay, that's that's again. Uh, uh, a very powerful leadership principle that it's not just pointing people, telling, pointing to people or telling people how they should live their lives according to scripture, but really showing it in our lives by example, right? So not just teaching uh, about things and this is what the Bible says, this is what scripture says, but showing that in our own lives and saying, you know, you look at my life, this is what I do, because this is what scripture says, this is what Jesus says, so this is what I do, and you can follow me as I follow Christ. Okay, so he, he talks about uh, verse 2, um, says, uh, you remember me in all things, and uh, also keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So, you know, some things that he is he has spoken to them and and verbally you know some traditions um so he has uh, which means you know some instructions uh, he has given to them now he's saying you know we don't know what these are you know it's, there's no record but um though it is not uh, stated like it it could likely be the sacraments in the church meaning again the lord's table 
and uh, talking about maybe water baptism, right? It could be it could be because of uh, because everyone in the, in the early church had an understanding of it, so it could be because of, it could be that, right? Okay, then he talks about another thing, but I want you to know, okay? And from then on till uh, uh, verse sixteen, right? From three to sixteen, he's uh, talking about uh, uh, you know about head covering, and he's also talking about headship, okay? Uh, which means uh, uh, about divine order and uh, and also divine uh, divine uh, what's the term divine uh, maybe divine order. God's design of a uh, flow of authority and leadership and so on, like spiritual leadership. Um, so, um, so this is something that he goes on to share. So, let, so let's read it, right? Verse three onwards. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered dishonors his head but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved for if a woman is not covered let her also be shorn uh, but if it is if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved let her be covered for a man indeed ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God but woman is the glory of man for man is not from woman but woman from man nor was man created for the woman but woman for the man for this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels nevertheless neither is man independent of woman nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper to... Does not even nature teach itself, not nature itself teach you if man has his honor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such customs, nor do the churches of God. Okay, so we need to understand that Paul, whatever he's addressing here, he's addressing something uh, in, that he's addressing here are only for the Corinthian church. Okay. And some things that he are he is mentioning here he has mentioned elsewhere also, other places in the in his epistles, uh, other places in the New Testament uh, things are mentioned, right? And uh, and so uh, we need to make that uh, distinction, okay? So he needs we need to uh, make that uh, or see that difference, okay? Here are some things that he is talking. Uh, only to the Corinthian church is not is not talked elsewhere else elsewhere in in his epistles, um, and uh, here are some things that he's talking to um, you know he's talking he's mentioned this in other places in scripture, uh, the New Testament talks about it the Lord talks about it so um, so here are a few other things right so uh, for us when we make that um, distinction now why should we make that distinction why should we know that difference so then we'll know that okay. This is something cultural, okay, which means that uh, regarding the culture of that place, and it's, sorry, this is an instruction which is given specifically for this church. And uh, so that, that truth is not applicable to all. This instruction is not applicable to everyone. It is specific for that region, for that particular place, for that people. Okay, so it's it's good for us to understand that. Okay, so uh, in your notes, you know, page ninety, starting from ninety and ninety-one, there is a table which uh, talks about 
this which addresses this uh, very clearly and uh, and it's good for us to uh, take a look at that okay um, maybe i'll project it so that it's it's good um, let me see okay hopefully you can see this um, i'll just wait okay so you see that um okay so um so we see that uh, what is addressed in other places in scripture and what is addressed exclusively for the corinthian church and also we mentioned something that is mentioned for the you know one instruction which is mentioned for the efficient church as well okay so spiritual headship okay now these are it's it you know what he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. Okay, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So when he says uh, head, he's talking about uh, uh, he's not talking about the physical head. He's talking about headship. Okay, which means uh, okay uh, if you look at uh, yeah, I just highlighted here. So it's representing authority, leadership, governing. Uh, you know the design, divine design for government. Okay, how things should be run, etc. Okay, so yeah, so it's talking about headship, and simultaneously, he's in the verses five to sixteen. He's talking about head covering. Now that is different from headship. Okay, we need to understand that. We're going to look at that. So he's talking about physical head covering. Okay. And uh, we see that there's one verse he talks about that regarding the, the Corinthian church. Then he's talking about you know in, when it refer, when it, when it comes to the Lord's table, there are all these scriptures. You know we looked at the Lord's table. Uh, Paul makes mention of it in the previous chapter uh, about the cup and the uh, the bread and the body. Uh, how how we are you know one how we come into uh, the communion. He talks about that and in. In this chapter, also towards the end, he talks about that as well, like maintaining right order and so on. Okay, so he talks about that. And uh, in Corinth, there was a situation, and he is he's, he's going to you know, address that, so which is specific for Corinth, for the Corinthian church. Okay, then. About women praying, prophesying, preaching. You know, in verse five, it says, "Every woman who prays or prophesies." So, which means praying, prophesying by women, it's fine, right? And we see that in several other places that there were believers gathered together, men and women, who were praying. The Spirit of God poured out on men and women who were praying and they experience the baptism of the holy spirit so we see that um and when he's talking about the gifts you know we're going to see that so he's talking about all men and women Ephesians four. so um so women praying prophesying preaching ministering okay so we see that but specifically he gives instruction to the corinthian church okay he says be silent okay we've studied that one corinthians 14 and also first timothy chapter 2 where he says, you know, uh, let them learn in silence. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Timothy 2, he says, you know, I do not permit a woman to uh, speak, let them, uh, let them keep silent in church and so on. So that we know is typically for the uh, Corinthian church and the Eph uh, church in Ephesus, like Timothy. It's an emphasis, and that instruction is so. As they had a similar issue or a similar problem, which he's addressing. Okay, so it's good for us to know the difference, so that we know what is truth that we can apply in our day and time, and what is uh, something that is specific for that for that day, for the, those people, and for that particular time. Okay. So that's uh, that's important for us. So what does he say? He says, uh, you know, I want you to know that uh, verse three, right? He says, the, this is, you know, the head of man is Christ. The head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. So he's referring to, um, you know, uh, he's giving some kind of a headship here. 
you know, a, a design of headship, a design of a flow of authority, and so on. So he's he's giving it here, right? He's placing this here. So the word used there, man, woman, uh, it could refer to any male. Okay, so it could be a male when you say, okay, this is a male gender, it could refer to male, or it could refer to a husband, right? Similarly, the word used there for woman uh, could be referred to, uh, you know, it could mean a, a woman of a, a female gender, or uh, it could also mean a wife, okay? So when he says, uh, the head of the woman is the man, he's referring to a marriage relationship, right? Where he's saying that, uh, you know, we see that in Ephesians 5 also, right? Be submissive, Ephesians 5, 22. Uh, of course, 21, he says, submit to one another in the Lord. And then verse uh, 21, 22 says, uh, you know, women are to be submit to their own husbands and so on, right? Um, so we see that. Okay. So now, um, so that is something that we need to keep in mind. Okay. He's talking about a marriage relationship and he's giving a, a template or a design for um, a, a divine authority, uh, a, a divine order. He's, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's saying that this is what it is, right? The head, head of every man is Christ, uh, meaning that every man is uh, submitted to Christ, and the head of Christ is God, referring to the Father and Christ, okay? So for us to understand this relationship uh, between man and woman, so we, we look at, uh, you know, what he's referring to as uh, the relationship between the, the headship or the relationship between Christ, the Son, and the Father. You know, so we know that the Father, the Son, are co-equal. Right? John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. So deity, co-equal, not one less than the other. Right? So that so there's no superior inferior there. They are co-equal. So that is what we see in John 1, 1, right? Yet, of course, the son took the place and submitted, willingly submitted to the plan and purpose of the father to come give himself as a ransom for many and uh, and the plan of, great plan of redemption, right, uh, happened. So, in, so also when it comes to man, woman, uh, referring to a, you know, husband and wife, they are co-heirs of the grace of God. They are co-heirs, meaning they're co-equal, and uh, there's no, you know, several scriptures, like First Peter 3, 7, okay, they're co-heirs together of the grace of God. Galatians 3, 28, Colossians uh, also, uh, 1, 11 also talks about that. So there is no, uh, sorry, Colossians, uh, I think it's Colossians 3, uh, just one second. Um, yeah, Colossians 3.11, um, there it talks about the you know difference between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, and so on. There it doesn't refer to man and woman, um, but it's, you know, uh, on the similar lines, you know, there is no division because everyone is one in Christ. Okay. So here, Galatians 3.28 specifically talks about, you know, male, female, etc. Right. So there is no differentiation. Okay. Um, so in verse 11, um, he says, you know, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man. Um, so if, just as woman came from man, even so, man also comes through woman. You know, a woman gives birth to a male baby, grows up to be a man. Well, in the in, his, in the creation account, we read that Eve was created after Adam and out of Adam. So both are there, right? So, uh, so which means there is an interdependency and uh, the one who, the, uh, between, you know, the husband and the wife. So, so the, the thing is that uh, they are, the wife is submitted to the husband and uh, it's not because man is superior and woman is inferior, but it's the divine design of God. Okay. Uh, this is how he designed and so submits to the, the wife submits to the leadership of the husband.
willingly okay and uh, so he's, he's making it very clear so even in the local church you know the, the if there are you know women then they submit to the leadership and if it happens to be a man you know a male leadership they submit okay so th that does not mean that women cannot be leaders in the church we know Ephesians 4 you know the the fivefold ministry is not restricted to men but also you know men and women so yeah so now what is the uh, uh, what is what, what is Paul's uh, intent in sharing this he says he goes on to share that you know this is God's design you know, this this headship this uh, leadership this is God's design and it's not because of inferior superior right just like how God the Father and God the Son are one they are equal so man and woman in Christ they are co-heirs with Christ but just like how the son, son submitted to the leadership of the father and, and gave himself as a ransom. Therefore, the woman also, you know, the wife submits to the husband, willingly submits. And, you know, when you read Ephesians 5, we see that the uh, husband loves the wife as Christ loved the church. So we see it's a sacrificial love. It's a, you know, serving love. It's, you know, all that is there, aspect is there. Okay. So now, the cultural aspect is this, right? So he's in verse five, verses five to, um, you know, uh, five to maybe uh, to seven, you know, he's talking about uh, head covering. Uh, so the cultural context is that in Corinth, like in other places, the women had long hair and the married woman would have a head covering, okay? Um, a woman who is, uh, you know, a harlot or a prostitute, you know, the would have her head shaved uh, or, you know, cut or cut very short. That was also there in Corinth. Okay. So now in Corinth, in the church, people were getting saved and coming to church. So we, we would have people of all kinds of back so you would have unmarried women we would have married women we would have you know people who were in caught up in sin how do we know that we look at uh, we look at 1 corinthians chapter 1 okay if you can turn there quickly look at 1 corinthians 1 and uh, um and he uh, you know paul is saying hey uh, sorry 1 corinthians chapter 6 sorry sorry chapter 6 right chapter 6 and verse 9 so he's saying he lists down you know fornication idolatry adultery homosexual sodomites thieves covetous drunkards revilers okay so he's list down those kinds of sin and also sinful lifestyle and what does he say in verse 11 such were some of you okay so in such were some of you now, you are seated here in, you know, in church. Now, you were like this before. Before you were, and he goes on to say, you were sanctified, you were washed, you were justified in the name of the Lord. Okay, so in the Corinthian church, you had people who were from that kind of background, who had that kind of sinful lifestyle. Um, it is quite possible that the women were, you know, they were married women, they were single women, they were women who were, uh, you know, uh, maybe temple prostitutes, you know, the temple of Aphrodite was there. They were saved and they had come. So all kinds, so Paul had to explain, okay, uh, because this was creating a issue there. So I think, you know, in view of the cultural context and uh, the background, he's saying, you know, um, when you're going to be ministering in prayer, when you're prophesying, cover your head okay so because uncovering of the head meant something else culturally it meant that i'm not under you know authority it meant that a rebellious or a woman of loose morals okay so this is what it meant culturally a, a woman with very short hair or shown a hair that is cut or a hair or a head that is shaved meant something 
you know like even in you know uh, our day and time even in our you know let's say look you look at uh, um, you know i'm not saying indian culture but hindu culture you see that uh, a, a widow you know from a hindu culture would there nowadays it's not there you know it's not there anymore but then you know those days you would see that they would not wear jewels they would wear they would be typically dressed in white and uh, um, you know if they were wearing a tilak you know arabindi or a, you know the that would be taken off a woman would not continue to wear that so you know you understand that right so similarly a woman who would not have her hair, head covered it meant something so you know people in hindu culture would those days would look at someone like that and say okay she does not have a husband she is a widow right similarly here if a woman did not have her head covered they would they would assume something okay okay this person is like that um this person lives this kind of a life so he's saying you know you're praying prophesying in church ministering cover your head okay so something cultural okay. right so he says you know this is what uh, it is shameful for a woman to be shorn shaved uh, if it is same shameful let her be covered okay is it yes culturally it, it was considered shameful so you know you cover um in verse 10 uh, he he talks about something reason why it is important for this expression of submission to spiritual authority okay he says you know he's referring to Ephesians 3:10 where, where he says that um, where you know that the wisdom of god is made known is manifest is displayed by the church even to principalities and powers in the heavenly places you know, which includes angels right? the wisdom of god is made manifest by the church by the believers uh, because they are walking in something which you know which uh, angels even desire to look into right they the wisdom of god they're walking in salvation and and also the 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 wisdom that is made available uh, through christ or in Christ for the believer is made manifest or made visible um, by them <clears throat> to the world outside and to the heavenly, uh, you know, to the principal principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So Ephesians three talks about that. So, so as um, you know, a, a, as a as a symbol of authority. Again, you know, he's talking to them and he's saying, you know, you have. That the fact that you want to convey that you are under authority and the head should be you cover your head, okay. But um, he is very clear, right? When we when he comes to uh, verse, um, you know, just like how verse eleven says, you know, neither is man independent of woman nor woman independent of man in the Lord. Verse twelve he explains why, right? He goes on to say in verse 16, you know, if anyone seems to be contentious or, you know, you're fighting about this, fighting over this, he says, we have no such custom. Okay, so look at this, you know, saying this is a cultural thing. This is specific to Quran, so I'm giving this instruction. Okay, but if you, you know, if if you have any arguments against that and if you are, you know, if you, there are any contentions, uh, he's saying, you know, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Okay, so that's how um, uh, that's how he ends this whole thing of head covering, and also he ends the whole topic of headship. You know, he talks about headship, which he addresses uh, in verses, uh, you know, verses four and three, three, four and five. And uh, verses six onwards, he talks about the, the physical covering and and also, um, you know, uh, uh, the whatever is related to that the physical covering. And in verse sixteen, he says, you know, we don't have any such customs. Okay, so so as uh, people, you know, who are you know sharing the gospel, we 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 can. We can decide, you know, which means we have the freedom. Okay, is that 
the culture of the place. Okay, I know in, 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 we have certain traditions, you know, here in our own nation and different parts of the nation. You know, sometimes what is there in a in a village setting, rural setting, uh, you know, is different. Like here in some of the you know some of the city churches, you see that people walk into church with the footwear, right? Uh, well, the place is carpeted and the same people walk in, and whereas you know that there are certain places. Uh, where people walk in and they remove the footwear uh, outside uh, and so on, right? They do that. Uh, and also with regard to head covering, you know, there are certain traditions which, you know, where the women cover the head and, and go, and there are places where it does not happen. Uh, and uh, so, you know, what is cultural, you know, you, it's fine. But we need to understand as, people in spiritual leadership, we need to understand that there are no such customs, nor, uh, you know, nor do the churches of God. No, we have, we do not have such custom, nor do the churches of God. Okay, so he's narrating this, he's placing these instructions, which is specific to a place, a people, and of a certain culture. Okay, and it's important that we understand that. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop here, and then we'll, we'll pick up from verse 17 uh, till the end of the chapter in next class. Okay. Okay. Have a great weekend. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor.